I am Alex Russell. I am a program manager on the Microsoft Edge team now. And it's taken me a little while to retrain myself to say that, because I used to say I'm an engineer on the Chrome team. And uh, I used to you know, do things like um, lead up the Fugu effort or uh, work on some of the performance issues the, that were mentioned earlier. And, um, and now I do something different. I'm not exactly sure what that different thing is, uh, but, but I'm Alex Russell. I'm a program manager on the Edge browser. <laughs> My pronouns are he, him. Um, and uh, normally I get up and I talk to you about uh, things like web performance and how the choices that we make as web developers impact users, uh, particularly marginalized users, and how we can do a better job using the tools that the platform gives us. Um, and thankfully, someone else has covered that already today. So I'm going to have to be on some different bullshit. Uh, so what is, what is that going to be? Um, for the last couple of years, I have been fixated on the question of why is it that the web has not taken over mobile the way it has desktop. So if you look at the current state of the world on desktop, I think it's fair to say that our grand collective assault on computing uh, to go and I don't want to use uh, too aggressive terms, but to, to make it possible to take most of your computing with you to any device with nothing but a web browser, make that safe, reliable, efficient, kind of fun and good, and do most of the stuff that you want to do is going gangbusters. It's working. Um, some very large fraction of CPU time uh, is spent executing browsers today. Um, I've, Intel had stats on this at some point, and it's, it's north, north of 50%. Um, browsers are the most frequently used uh, programs on the operating system uh, from the company I now work for. And this is um, you know, the continuation of a trend that started 30 years ago. It wasn't always the case. Uh, Win32 applications were the, the future and the present, as far as anyone knew, uh, back when I was starting to become a web developer. It seemed like a bit of an exotic choice. It was new and it was fresh, but it was certainly not dominant uh, the way it is now. So, so why hasn't that happened on mobile, right? We've, we've had something like, what is it? Uh, 2007, eight uh, was the original iPhone. Um, and so we've had definitely more than a decade now of mobile devices being the present and future of computing. And the trend is actually going the wrong way. A couple of years ago, I was able to cite stats from the uh, Chrome team about how mobile usage of browsers was going as a fraction of time that people spend on device. And, and I was sad to report at the time that the uh, trend was declining year on year and already quite low, below 10%. Uh, there's no reason to think that that trend has changed. So, so why is it going, why is it K-shaped? Why is it going one way on desktop and another way on mobile? This, this seems bad. <laughs> um, so you might have heard the phrase uh, Hobson's choice uh, here and there. It's shorthand for a situation where you're presented with a choice that isn't really a choice at all. There might be many options, but none of them are real except the one that the proprietor would really like you to take because that's kind of the only one that works. The source of the shorthand is perhaps apocryphal, but um, if this 17th century portrait of one very, uh, well, let's go with handsome, um, Thomas Hobson is anything to go by, uh, the proprietor of a um, livery stable in Cambridge uh, used to offer uh, to folks who would like to rent a horse for the day, think Uber for hooves, um, he would offer uh, any horse in the 40 horse barn except uh, you could only really pick the one at the door. Um, there, maybe there's a good reason for this. Maybe it, maybe it keeps horses from being worn out. The, the good ones are fresh at the back, but you only get the one at the door, uh, and they can cycle them out. Right? Maybe there's some, some reason to do this. But uh, it is the origin of the idea that uh, there is the appearance of many choices, but not lots of them. And with a vast menu of options and only one actual choice, um, this, this sort of allegory has stuck in lots of different domains, but I think it's probably the best description of the situation that we face uh, in our mobile browsing lives today for reasons that are unfortunately complicated, if not particularly complex. And it might surprise you as a result. So this is what I think our collective mental model of browsing is. Uh, you click on a link. If you're in a browser, you stay in that browser. If you are not in a browser, you go to the operating system. And the operating system dutifully sends that link, as long as it's to a web page, an HTTP colon slash slash HTTPS colon slash slash link. It takes that link and it sends you to your browser. 
That is to say, the browser that you installed as the default. Um, and so we have a sense that browsers are there to handle links, and it is the browser that you chose that handles your links. Um, and we built a norm around this. On desktop operating systems, it's considered a pretty serious bug if the answer to the question of uh, does this application load links in my browser is no. Right? It, it's antisocial. Uh, and, and this is a behavior that sort of reinforced application to application, again, through nothing but norms. Uh, but if the last, you know, five or six years aren't anything, um, they're certainly anything else. They're certainly a recognition that norms can erode. And the behavior of norms is really only as strong as the pushback that folks who attempt to violate them receive in return. Um, I'm here to tell you today a story about some, some bad erosion of norms. Uh, because the forces that we're up against on mobile uh, are sort of the op have created a situation that's sort of the opposite of what we have come to expect in that desktop uh, little flowchart of how we think that browsing works. And that means that for most new internet users, which is to say most people who come online today, do not start on a PC, they don't start on a desktop, they don't have laptops, they may never own a laptop. It is not the case that their computing world is going to be centered around browsers or know what a, the web is. Um, they will start from tapping and swiping, not clicking and typing. And the consequence of that is that how those norms are set as those folks begin to experience computing uh, will define the prospects for the web and for our collective futures. So uh, there's some really great news about how the competition that was enabled by that little flowchart that I showed earlier uh, works. So that is to say, when the links that you tap take you to a browser, and replacing that browser is a meaningful choice about how most links in the future end up being executed, it's extraordinarily valuable to go and compete about the consequence of handling that link. You can provide a lot of value as a browser vendor, it's sort of the job that I've, I've taken on, a, a, in the service of uh, doing a better job about the web content that someone else has produced on behalf of the user to the extent that when the user taps on a link, you get invoked. If you don't get invoked and you get installed or, or you're there, um, but you don't get used, you know, it's very much a tree falling in the forest moment. Uh, to, did it happen? Does it matter? So uh, that competition has, on desktop at least, delivered astonishing progress. Now this is just one small dimension. Um, you'll see that the, the rate of progress in this apparent chart from the V8 team back in 2018 levels off at the top. And that's because they changed their focus about optimization. Things didn't stop getting faster. They just started getting faster in slightly different dimensions. Better memory use, uh, better initial startup time. Um, and that story plays out over and over and over again. You look at all sorts of different manner of parts around the platform, from networking to uh, permissions to capabilities to uh, uh, privacy features to extensions. Everywhere you look, competition has driven the story of what the web's progress forward through a choice of browser. Um, and that is kind of the fundamental backdrop to, I think, the way we think about what it means to build on the web today. And some of the work that Stephanie was talking about earlier really drives that home. It will be the case that browsers that let you style stuff are going to be popular least with you, <laughs> um, and eventually, hopefully, with your users, too, because it'll mean that they'll download less stuff over the wire to recreate a date picker, which might already be there. You'll have more options for doing it more quickly. It will feel better. It will look better. It will work better. That's better. So this seems simple, but for competition to drive progress, the choices that users are allowed to make must matter. So uh, I want to talk about sort of uh, three uh, let's call them primary actors in removing choice from users on mobile. Google, Apple, and Facebook. We'll do it in order. Um, there's a lot here. There's a lot of different technologies involved. They're not surfaced to you as things that you either choose or know to use in many cases if you're not a native developer. So I'm going to try to like give you a whirlwind tour of the consequences. We could talk about the, some of the um, technologies underlying them at the pub later if you like. Um, but 
you may recognize this if you've used an Android device. Um, every Android device, uh, through a, a master agreement that Google signs with every o original equipment manufacturer, or ODM, OEM and ODM, uh, if you'd like access to the Play Store, it is a requirement that you put a search box prominently on the home screen of every Android device. Now, it will not surprise you to find that this drives an unholy amount of traffic. Um, people search a lot, right? If searching is right there and it's easy, this is good. And searching is not bad, that seems great. And in fact, this drives uh, searches to uh, the web. That's all, I work on the web, that seems great for me. Uh, what's not to like? So this is a Sankey diagram. I don't know if you're familiar with Sankey diagrams. Uh, you may see these in discussions of things like energy flows as we think about decarbonizing our economy. Um, they are a flow diagram of a type that lets you say, I've got a pile of inputs here and where do they eventually end up? So you can start to uh, account for them as they flow through um, the economy or through some, some multi-level or multi-process system. And so what you have on the left-hand side are sources and on the right-hand side you have sinks. So on the left-hand side here, we've got applications, uh, that home screen search widget on Android. Um, we've got explicit use of a browser, uh, either uh, Chrome or uh, a competing browser, which may not be your default browser, it may be your default in the, any of the competing versions. Um, as we see at the bottom, the very bottom, things that start in the browser stay in the browser. Okay, that seems pretty good. Um, now, in some cases, um, if you go to the home screen search widget, you would expect that if I installed a different default browser that I would get that to be the attributed bucket on the right hand side. But that's not what's going on here. It ends up in Chrome. It always ends up in Chrome. Um, this is an interesting consequence of a choice that Google has made. No matter which default browser you set, um, that traffic is eventually going to end up in Chrome. Uh, now. If your default browser was Chrome, a lot of that stuff on the, let's go back a, a second. If your default browser is Chrome, a lot of your state as an end user ends up in a single bucket, that yellow bucket, right? That yellow bucket is, is a very valuable bucket. Because what it does is it says, um, every time I invest my browser with a privacy choice or a security choice or something about extensions or settings or preferences about certain websites or I give it information about myself, my login, my credentials, my form, autofill data, all the stuff that will make it easier for me to get around the web, make the web livable in some cases um, or more private or acceptable to me in others, uh, those things follow me around because my browser is my browser and my browser is my agent. This is really just a question about to what extent is my browser my user agent. And the picture that we've got here is um, some set of applications skim some traffic off the top from the web. This is just the way Android works uh, through something called intent filters. We can talk about it later. Um, but a lot of it ends up in Chrome. And it, that big pile of value is really valuable, not just to the you, you and me as users, but also to us as people who make the web. Uh, it makes it easier for folks to check out. It means that a lot of the uh, campaigns that we might run uh, will be attributed more correctly, which in, fa in fact will raise the CPMs on our websites. And so we will make more money uh, on the front end and the back end of traffic that is sent to us. So having that single pile of value has been extraordinarily valuable. Um, breaking it up uh, undermines all of this value for both sides of the equation. Um, now, what if uh, your, your default browser wasn't Chrome, uh, but more importantly, um, what if Google undermined even that thing, where instead of leaving you in Chrome, when you tap on a link from the search results page in Android, you end up in a kind of a knockoff browser, right? Kind of like a web view kind of thing. Um, Google is experimenting with this right now. Uh, it's called WebLayer, um, and uh, it has a lot of features. Uh, and a lot of those features are, will end you up in a similar sort of mirror universe of uh, you, your data and your preferences not following you around. So if you configured your privacy preferences one way in Chrome, good luck to you. Um, well, what about Apple, right? Certainly uh, the defenders of all of our collective privacy, I've been told, um, <laughs> must, must have something better on offer. Uh, so again, uh, the dominant way of using uh, mobile computing uh, on fruit, uh, phones is also through applications. Um, and by the way, these are all these are all sort of made up sort of flows. None of these are real numbers. I'm just sort of like giving you a sort of a, a, 
a very evocative sense of how this actually works out. They're, they're not, um, they're informed by experience, they're informed by data I've seen, they are not the data I've seen, they are not true experiences. Um, so many applications will continue to send users to something called an in-app browser. We saw this over in the, the Android version as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but historically, the situation was that uh, up until uh, iOS 14.0, one and like a couple of patch releases after that because they screwed it up the first couple of times. Um, but as of like 14.1 and then a little bit, uh, you were able to finally set a different default browser. But up until uh, less than a year ago, for more than 13 releases of iOS, it might have been a surprise to you that you could install any browser that you liked, except um, that it could never be the system default browser. Tapping on any link from any application would always take you into Safari all the time. Um, you might have wanted a different user agent, but you really had to fight for it every time you tapped on a link. Um, the situation has evolved. This is good. This is real progress. Uh, your default browser, that little yellow thing, is, is actually sort of uh, it's in with a chance. Um, there's still a lot of traffic being sent to your in-app web views, and Safari will still get a bunch of it from different applications. Part of this comes from something called uh, SF Safari View Controller, which is the analog to something we'll talk about later called Chrome Custom Tabs or CCT. But the idea with these systems is um, uh, maybe people don't want you to have to bounce all the way out of an application all the way into another application to go launch a link. They want to kind of keep you inside the first app. So if you tap a little X, you're back instantly. Um, there's lots of good reasons to do this, uh, mostly around memory uh, and eviction for the application state. Um, but uh, OSs now provide universally a way to do this. And um, good OSs provide a way to do this uh, that respects your browser choice. Uh, iOS does not. Um, and so that's where we are. But the real problem for us as web developers is um, that while you now have the simulacrum of choice, uh, you are able to install any browser that you like and potentially set it as the default for, brow for links that escape the application, uh, the application's context. Um, they all wind up being WebKit under the covers, and not just any WebKit. It's not like I, as a browser vendor, could take WebKit from webkit.org, compile it with different flags, uh, and ship it to the browser, and ship it to iOS uh, with a different branding on it. I am forced to use the binary that is on the device that Apple ships with the operating system for the web view. That is to say, all the feature flags are set by Apple, all of the features in or out all of the custom settings that they've made, all the accommodations one way or the other for things like performance flags or different, I don't know, audio and video formats, right? Like there are systems like um, VP8 and VP9 are well supported inside of upstream WebKit. You just can't have them on iOS, right? There's lots of stuff like that. Um, good luck getting AVIF. Um, and this is a result of policy. This is explicit policy on Apple's behalf. Uh, section uh, 2.5.6, uh, of the Apple App Store review guidelines say that uh, apps that browse the web must use the appropriate WebKit framework and WebKit JavaScript. Um, you would not naturally perhaps read uh, that sentence to impute uh, that your choice in browsers has suddenly become uh, a bit of a mirage, but that is the consequence. Um, and this wouldn't be a problem if WebKit um, and and, and not all WebKits, but specifically Apple's version of WebKit shipped to those devices, uh, was not uh, demonstrably terrible. <laughs> I don't say that lightly. Um, this is data from, I took last night from uh, the WebCompat 2021 dashboard. Uh, this is an aggro move. Uh, setting up a dashboard like this that tracks conformance with the worst developer pain points around things like Flexbox, um, have you tried to use Gap recently? How'd that go? Um, a whole number of CSS features, uh, things like pagination breaking, basic stuff. This is not pushing the boat out. This is not the exotic stuff. This is not the stuff that I have spent the last couple of years of my life on with Project Fugu. This is bread and butter basics about CSS layout and basic HTML conformance. Um, how were these doing? In, um, in WebKit and Safari? And the answer has been pretty abysmally up until now. Um, how, how can I make such an aggressive statement? Um, well, uh, Mozilla, a hard done by um, uh, plucky um, open source foundation driven uh, product 
uh, with significantly less resources available to it, has consistently uh, done a better job and delivered it faster. I think that last part is also critical. Um, you may see some news about some new feature coming in a Safari tech preview, uh, and then you may be able to use it in a couple of quarters rather than six weeks from now. Um, so, so there's both a, both a uh, sort of uh, content and consistency problem uh, with WebKit. And this holds true as you look more broadly. So this is from Web Confluence. Uh, unfortunately, this data is from earlier in the year. I didn't have a chance to, to rebuild this chart. But um, the Web Confluence data uh, looks around the environment with JavaScript and says, which Web IDL interfaces are available? It just sort of says, you know, tell me, tell me about your finest APIs. And uh, it makes a catalog of them. And what it gives us at the, at the limit is a chart to show us um, how quickly is the set of capabilities uh, and features expanding in the various engines. And again, Mozilla uh, is beating Apple handily, has for many years, um, with a more consistent delivery. And th even though they ha are falling significantly behind the Chromium project, um, they're still managing to beat Cupertino. Um, and of course, th th this is inexcusable, right? Like the, the amount of money that it takes to uh, fund Mozilla is something you can find in the chaise long of um, any Cupertino lounge, I suppose. Um, so, so why does this matter to us? Um, it is because uh, the web, if you think about it in economic terms, uh, it's not just a meta platform, although it is. It sits on top of other platforms and it provides a common API on top of them. But like in economic terms, what that does is through both sitting there as a piece of software, but then adding open licensing, open API access, portability, and reach to that equation, it drives the cost of using existing features in computers down to zero. Without meta platforms or something, some economic force like this, it might be possible for uh, an ambitious uh, oligopolist to close back over a bunch of APIs that had previously been open. Right? It might be possible to sort of take, uh, to build standards at one layer, let's say we all go and agree on the USB standard, and then close them over with uh, limited access to the APIs that would allow you to make best use of them at some higher layer. The web's contribution to this economic uh, system is to actually drop the price to zero. Uh, to the extent that those features are available everywhere. So once something is commodity, it's in most operating systems, that the, the sort of plurality of operating systems, and the majority of devices, this is a good place uh, for a meta platform to continue to commoditize, to fully commoditize uh, the capabilities of the underlying platforms uh, by making them safe, by attenuating their downsides from learning from what has come before, but then distributing that learning as broadly as possible at the lowest possible cost. Um, and when that process is not allowed to move forward at the usual clip, uh, what we experience is a relevance gap. That is to say that the features get, get added on top that you are not able to address suddenly to a developer start to look like a problem. They don't instantaneously, but if at some limit in the future, they come up for air from the last project and go, okay, what can I do now? And the answer is not very much. Um, whereas previously it might have been, yeah, you know, most of what you need to do, uh, then that starts to create a market for alternatives. So uh, the job of the web is to keep up, and it is to keep this relevance gap. Maybe there can be long, stagnant periods, but to, to, to catch up every now and again uh, to the rate at which computing is expanding to add new capabilities. And so um, the empire can strike back. Right. It is possible for a single operating system vendor to exert um, undue control in order to ensure that the capabilities uh, that otherwise would be expanded universally are denied uh, market reach for the web uh, through policy or through inaction in some cases. We've all got some experience of that. Um, and so what Apple has done by dragging everyone back to their slow pace of progress and ensuring that nobody can compete effectively on their popular operating system is a real and compounding threat to the web's relevance. So um, you may have seen that uh, Safari 15 is out. It's got great stuff. I'm so excited. It's got broadcast channel. Uh, or sorry, the tech review from last night has broadcast channel. Um, Safari 16 has a bunch of great stuff. They're working on push notifications. That's great. Uh, but I think we should be looking a little bit further afield. When can we start to count uh, universally on access to things like uh, threading and SIMD operations on these mobile devices? Uh, WebGPU, WebXR, um, the full screen API. Today on iOS, you can use the full screen API as long as the only thing you choose to use it on is a video element. 
On the back of this, in addition to the GamePad API, we now have a revolution in game streaming on our hands. Stadia, Xbox, Cloud, Gaming, uh, xCloud, whatever we call it. Um, uh, Luna, GeForce Now, everybody and their brother has decided to stand up a data center, put some very expensive computers in it, and use WebRTC to send you games um, all at once because just a few capabilities came together. What are the set of things that we are not able to build because these APIs are not available to us? Or we can't even imagine them becoming universally available to us. Only Apple knows and they aren't talking. Okay. I, I, we, we have a three, uh, a three hour, three villain tour. Um, uh, so, so what is Facebook's role in uh, undermining choice? Um, please send me a tab that I can load this URL in. And so it just loads it inside the same process. It runs it inside the same um, activity on Android. And so you don't actually have to leave uh, the uh, application that you're in in order to do this. And so a native application developer can adopt CCT. And what it does is it means that they get the benefits of content running in a real browser with all the tests passing. I'm just going to stress that enough. Things like installation to the home screen, you know, background sync, context API, all this stuff. Uh, it's all there. And uh, that means that the user's choice and preferences are also all there. Have I installed an ad blocker? Have I set my privacy preferences somehow? Have I changed my accessibility settings? Have I improved um, my relationship to some website by previously giving it credentials that it can autofill or logging it in automatically or giving me my form autofill so that when I want to go to a checkout, uh, it knows what my postcode is? Have I done any of these things inside of my browser while they follow me around as long as I'm using CCT? Um, and uh, what we see here, uh, a little bit distressingly, is the exact same thing being loaded uh, from a link uh, in a Facebook newsfeed. I tap uh, inside the Facebook native application, uh, and what I get is a, is a UI that looks almost identical. It's so hard to tell these apart, right? It's, a, it's just a little bit at the top, that little iconography, um, whether or not the URL is being shown with a lock icon or not. Um, there's a three dot menu, the dot is a different way around, whatever, right? Like these are very small visual things. They don't tell you I'm in a totally different browser, but this is a different universe in fact. Um, and if you tap into that little three dot menu, what you'll find is that um, there is an open in Samsung internet button, so it detects that I, it knows what my default browser is, right? It, it can tell you that that's what it is, um, but it's not going to do that because this is the Facebook mobile browser. And the Facebook mobile browser may be uh, the most popular browser you've never heard of and never explicitly used. And it is wildly popular. It drives a huge amount of traffic and this is an incredible problem uh, for everyone. Because if you are a publisher and you would like to have users, I don't know, if you set up a paywall and you'd like to have users sign in to receive the benefits of the services that they've paid for, well, good luck to you because this browser doesn't know anything about any of that, even though the user will have invested their time, effort, and state into the default browser, which is sitting there just on the system uh, one CCT call away. Does Facebook know any of this? No. More to the point, they also, by having built this on top of a web view um, and not investing enough uh, in the process, have nerfed many of these really important APIs, things like push notifications. This is particularly um, dodgy. Can you think of any company in the world that sends more push notifications to end users than Facebook? <laughs> if Facebook was forced to be on the web in a browser that did not have push notifications, would they not be screaming to the most uh, powerful entity that they could find about how deeply unfair all of this was? And yet they do it to everyone else. Um, this, this is deep. It goes to accessibility settings. Oh, by the way, good, good luck finding um, uh, the places where you can uh, uh, manage this stuff inside of the Facebook application. Um, uh, having built, having, having the system provide 80% of a browser, Facebook has decided to do uh, a small fraction of the remaining 20% or 80% of the work to actually turn it into a real browser. And what that means is that a huge fraction of what we see looks like Chrome, looks like Chromium, it's got the web view uh, user agent, and it is bad. Um, these are the only settings that are available in it. Um, and if you want to disable it as an end user, you will have to do that per application on every device separately. Um, 
I think the, the most tell, the, the most gutting tell, is that a couple of days ago, uh, Facebook announced to their developers uh, using their SDK in native Android applications uh, that web views are no longer good enough for Facebook. Uh, you'll have to use Chrome custom tabs if you'd like to log in with the Facebook service. Uh, so it's not good enough for Facebook even. Oh, and um, it's worth noting that Google is toying with the same nonsense. Uh, this is being deployed uh, on Google Go, uh, which is uh, in the Android SKU for low-end devices, memory-constrained devices, CPU-constrained uh, uh, devices. Um, the Google Go application uh, uses a web view, uh, and much like the, um, the web view in Facebook, it is also deeply, deeply, deeply broken. Uh, Google has made another browser, and it is not very good. Um, so I, I, have, um, I have a pile of problems. We have a pile of problems, and I have a modest proposal, among several others. Um, and that is that as web developers, uh, we should be allowed to, to ask uh, to actually be put inside the user's default browser. It shouldn't probably matter how. That CCT UI, it's, kinda, it's not perfect, but like, that's an end user choice. Um, Popping a user all the way out to a real browser, quote unquote, uh, also maybe not the best choice in every situation. Um, I get that. Um, but maybe we can make a middle. Uh, we can say that web views are great. They're there for things like displaying ads or helps in articles or first party application text. So uh, the Gmail application, for instance, renders all of your emails in a web view. That's great. It's first party content. It, it should be allowed to do that. We shouldn't necessarily have to kill web views dead. They provide real value to native applications and cooperating second parties. And even for third parties that want to be loaded inside uh, of an application, maybe it is OK for them not to actually punch out to the user's default browser. If I'm doing an authentication flow, for instance, it's not going to be a great experience necessarily uh, to do that, although I think the Facebook example proves that CCT is superior even there. But we as developers uh, sending a web page to an end user in the top level context should be able to say to the browser, uh, don't web view me, bro. Um, we should be able to say something along the lines of, please use the system default browser to load this web page. Um, so that is to say, the, the market that we're making is the user installed a default browser, and we as developers say we would like to use that default browser. Um, this is a thing that should be available as a two-sided opt-in. This should be a thing. Um, and so I know that I am uh, somewhat over time, but I, I deeply appreciate uh, the chance to, to be back in person with all of you and to uh, not just talk about problems, but also potentially some ways that we could think about fixing it. Um, so thank you so much.